One of the many fun things about Disney movies, besides of course the fact that they're Disney movies, is seeing how they interpret existing stories. A decent percentage of Disney's film catalog is based off of existing novels, fables, and mythology. These movies have been carefully crafted to honor tales as old as time, while providing a uniquely Disney vision to the end result. Sometimes, the most successful films take inspiration from well-loved stories, while placing it in a completely new skin. Like, remember when Disney made Shakespeare's Hamlet? No? Well, what about Romeo and Juliet? I am referring, of course, to the Lion King trilogy. Released in 1994, The Lion King is actually Shakespeare's Hamlet in lion's clothing. A few years later, in 1998, the direct-to-video movie Lion King 2, Simba's Pride, is Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, without the tragic death of the main characters. In fact, they even have Tom Stoppard's Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. A story of two minor characters from Hamlet watching the play unfold from their own point of view. Similar to Timon and Pumbaa in The Lion King One and a Half. While at first glance these films seem to have their own original story, they all go back to Shakespeare. So what do you think? Is it to be or not to be? Overall, Disney films succeed in these retellings of classic stories by finding a nice balance of family-friendly and honoring the true source material. Even the Greek mythology of Hercules wound up being drastically toned down for a more family-friendly version, while The Little Mermaid skips its notoriously deadly ending. The Lion King starts off as a story about a young cub named Simba, knowing that when he gets older, he will become the king of the Pride Lands. Hamlet also belongs to royal family, Family and is the Prince of Denmark. While many Disney leads are known for their royalty, Simba and Hamlet share the unfortunate trait of having a jealous uncle that wants their king dad out of the picture. Now, Simba is pretty excited about eventually becoming the king and actively sings about how he plans to rule everything the light touches. But his uncle Scar is pretty bitter about the whole affair, seeing as he was due to be next in line prior to Simba's birth. With some careful manipulation, Scar puts Simba and Mufasa in terrible danger, where Mufasa loses his life trying to save Simba from a wildebeest stampede. While Hamlet, unfortunately, never breaks into a musical number, he does wind up having a dead father and an uncle who swoops in to marry the queen, or his mom, immediately becoming king of Denmark as a result. Hamlet's father's ghost pops in to inform him that his brother is responsible for his murder, and would really love his son Hamlet to go in for some well-deserved revenge. We know later on that in The Lion King, Mufasa's ghost does appear but with a much nicer request to remember who you are. Hamlet is sent to way to England by his uncle, with no knowledge of his uncle's plan to have the English king execute him. While Simba runs away from his problems, Scar takes over the Pride Lands and everything becomes pretty miserable. Meanwhile, for Hamlet, Horatio is considered his truest friend. Simba is taken by Rafiki to meet with his ghost dad, who puts him down the right moral path, allowing Simba to have the confidence to take over his uncle. Hamlet ends up in a big fencing duel. Eventually, Scar corners him and reveals the truth that he actually ended up killing Mufasa, bringing new anger and strength to Simba, allowing him to defeat his uncle and send him to his death of being eaten alive by hyenas. In both Hamlet and The Lion King, the main characters complete their goals and their character arts, but with considerably different endings. On the other end of Shakespeare's popular plays, we see Romeo and Juliet, the tragic tale of star-crossed lovers from feuding families. In The Lion King 2, Simba's Pride, we catch up with Simba's family now that he is the father of a young cub named Kiara. Kiara winds up befriending Kovu, a cub selected by Scar to be his successor. Kovu, however, is part of a group of lions that Simba banned from the Pride Lands because they swore allegiance to Scar. Simba forbids his daughter from ever meeting with Kovu again. Years later, Kovu is sent on a mission to kill Simba. In the process, though, the two fall in love, but Scar's followers take that as an opportunity to attack the king. Simba is almost killed, but survives, and gets super angry at Kovu for lying to him. But in the end, Kovu and Kiara manage to convince their clashing prides to 
to put their differences aside for the better of the community. The similarities between this film and Romeo and Juliet don't stretch far beyond the original concept. You know, of feuding sides and star-crossed lovers. And finally, there's The Lion King One and a Half. The story of what was going on with Timon and Pumbaa during the events of The Lion King. Humorously, this pairs nicely with the 1960s Tom Stoppard play Rosencrantz and Guildenstern Are Dead, where two minor characters in Hamlet, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, wind up watching the story from an outside perspective. While Timon and Pumbaa's plot doesn't really match up with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern's, it's nevertheless an amusing comparison. So how does this all really hold up? There's no doubt that these Lion King films pay tribute to some of Shakespeare's greatest work, but the influence is still fairly limited compared to the other Disney film adaptions. While many of the elements are the same in Hamlet and The Lion King, much of the overall plot comes from the core difference that Simba prides itself with not personally seeking revenge from the get-go. Simba's character arc is all about not running from the past, but learning from it. Most of Hamlet's story involves everybody acting childish and effectively killing each other off thanks to misunderstandings and a large helping of insanity. Simba's story is genuinely happier. He gets the girl, almost everyone lives, and he saves the kingdom. Part of his success can be attributed to a solid set of role models, with Mufasa, Zazu, Nala, and Rafiki offering responsible guidance, while Timon and Pumbaa taught him to enjoy life. Perhaps if the people in Hamlet's life were less vengeful or insane, he could have ended up with a happier ending. Similarly with The Lion King 2 and Romeo and Juliet, the main cast learns to set aside their differences for the sake of two young lovebirds. Luckily, Simba was able to come to his senses before Kiara or Kovu ended up dramatically dying. In a way, Disney films are a sort of rewriting where a better lesson is learned, and the end result is shown to be happiness instead of tragedy. While this may not exactly reflect reality in everyday life, it is a wonderful sentiment to suggest that we can make the world a better place before tragedy strikes, and people end up poisoning the wine. Now that's the real Akuna Matata. In the comments, let me know what you guys thought of this conspiracy, and if you agree or disagree with how I analyzed it. I mean, this theory was like my two favorite things, Shakespeare and Disney movies. All great things. Make sure you subscribe to Channel Frederator, and I'll see you all next week. There are many reasons to love Steven Universe. The amazing music, the cool cameos, and the effortless diversity easily make it a crowd favorite in the cartoon world. This universe protecting team of magical beings live in a world rich of mythology and mystical origins. And we're constantly learning more about where these characters came from and what's in store for them for the future. Still, some characters remain more mysterious than others. Take Jasper, for example. She's a homeworld gem and one of the shows main antagonists. Jasper is known for being ruthless and arrogant, as well as an aggressive fighter. She always looked down on the crystal gems and insulted them relentlessly. For now, she's being held captive at the bottom of the ocean with the unstable fusion Malachite, after convincing Lapis Lazuli to fuse with her in order to defeat the crystal gems. And that didn't work out so well. But somehow, we don't think it'll be long before she gets out and seeks revenge on our beloved crystal gems. But what if it's more than blind hatred? What if Jasper hates fusion so much because she is one?